All right. Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, getting myself into slideshow mode. Well, that wasn't the right place to start, huh? Let's start at the beginning. Always a good place to start. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, what is what is calculus about. Um, most of you have already taken some calculus. Some of you who have not, not to worry, many of you said that the calculus that you've taken is so long ago <laughs> and you haven't used it since that it's a, just it's just a dim memory. So uh, I don't think you're at such a great disadvantage if you haven't taken calculus before. What we're gonna to try to do is show certainly some of the history of, this, of the subject where it came from, because that's really part and parcel of what calculus is. And uh, also it's a very good way to present the ideas, the conceptual ideas of the calculus, which is what our goal is. Our goal, this is not Calc 1, uh, you know, over in, uh, in the undergraduate math department. That's not what this course is at all. I don't think any, if you wanted, that, if you wanted to do that, then that's, that that's available to you. <clears throat> so this is a course that's not gonna be um, he heavily laden with a lot of algebraic manipulations. And we'll see why that will be a natural thing if you're going to truly teach all the techniques uh, of calculus, why it is so algebraically intensive. We'll see why that's the case uh, um, at some point. But we're going to uh, uh, avoid that and not go there and try to stay with the ideas. We will have some, of course, uh, algebra. We need to express uh, our, idea, our ideas algebraically because we'll be working in the paradigm of analytic geometry, uh, one of the great inventions in the history of mathematics, the marrying of geometry and algebra. That's what makes it so powerful. So therefore, the algebra becomes a language for the geometry. Uh, but we're going to stay away as much as we can from a lot of heavy algebraic manipulations. Um, many of you, that there, there would be no problem in doing that. Many of you are uh, very strong in algebra. Some of you here, by the way, welcome. Uh, people who took the algebra course in the fall with me, uh, you're all primed up to, to pursue uh, the calculus on a real algebraic basis but many of us here have not. And I'm going to assume that many of us have not been solving equations lately. So we're not going to uh, make the assumption that that's just a natural, simple thing to do. So the little bit of algebraic manipulations that we will do will be very, very simple. I'll try to explain them uh, as much as we, we, I think is necessary, um, but feel free to just glaze over uh, if the algebra gets too thick for you. Just take my word for it that the algebra I'm doing is correct, leading from one step to another. The details truly are not important uh, on, on one level, on the, on the conceptual level. When the algebra is important for the conceptual level, then we will talk about it. Okay, we won't shy away from anything which is essential uh, in order to try to understand uh, the concepts. So if we are doing, if we are getting into algebra, please trust me that this is not uh, fortuitous, uh, uh, gratuitous, I mean, it is because I feel it really is essential to understand the idea. And what you're looking at here in this first slide really is the three, you know, big, uh, the, these icons, these, these pictures represent the three great ideas really that we'll be talking about for the whole, for the whole course. One could ask, you know, what is the objects that calculus studies? As I said in the uh, in the in the write-up of the course, the description course description, you can think of algebra, you know, basically as the study in the properties of numbers and geometry, the study in the property of figures of all kinds. What would be that equivalent thing for calculus? And uh, turns out that it is functions. What we truly, after all, will have to get there uh, historically. Uh, but uh, eventually we will see very clearly that what calculus studies is functions and their properties. Um, everything will be turned into, into that kind of a language. But the two great problems of calculus historically was geometric problems. One was having a curve um, and finding a slope. I'm sorry, I misspoke. 
I'm ahead of myself, find the tangent line to that curve. The slope is an algebraic idea, but for Greek geometry, which is where we're going to start our history next, next week, um, we were looking for the tangent line, the constructed line itself. That was one great problem that leads to the calculus. The other problem turns out to be a harder problem, and that is to find the area created by curves, surrounded by curves, enclosed by curves, in between two curves. This is a, turns out to be a much harder problem. Those two problems lead to the two divisions uh, uh, of calculus, so-called differential calculus and the integral calculus. The differential calculus being with the tangents, the integral calculus being uh, with finding these areas. Okay, so with that, um, let's get started. The origins of calculus. Again, we pose the question, what were the mathematical and physical problems? Haven't mentioned that yet the physical problems which led to the development of calculus. Uh, one way to answer the question, what is calculus about, is to say, well, calculus is about the mathematical solutions that mathematicians found for those problems. That is what the subject, ultimately, of the original elementary calculus is. Those problems are of two flavors. One is there is a geometric side to the set of problems. I mentioned tangents to curves and areas bounded by curves. There's also, by the way, an allied problem. Let me get the picture up. There's also an, an allied problem with each one, interestingly enough. Allied with finding the tangent to curves is also to finding extreme values of curves, the highest point on a curve, the lowest point on a curve, the furthest the point is on, on a curve from some particular point or for some particular line. What's the closest that the curve approaches that line? Questions of extreme values. Uh, in the jargon, they're called max-min problems, if you remember from Calc 1. Uh, that's also turns out to be very much historically an allied problem uh, in the development of the calculus, and it goes with that tangent problem, although it may not seem so uh, at first. The other set of problems that lead to the calculus is of much, much more current and uh, vintage. Uh, it uh, goes back only to the scientific revolution <laughs> of the 17th century, as opposed to these original problems, which go back to the ancient Greeks. Those are problems of motion. Uh, could describe them as finding the velocity of an object in which the velocity is changing all the time. It turns out to be a an interesting and difficult problem. To find the trajectory, the path of an object that's moving with a continuously changing velocity. These also problems also led to the development of the calculus in the scientific revolution. This is when calculus was developed. It was developed in the 17th century. It was developed in the 1600s. First of all, we have the, um, uh, the, the great in innovation of the early 1600s of analytic geometry by Descartes and Fermat. And then we have uh, lots of work going on with mathematicians of that era, finally leading to Newton and Leibniz developing the algorithms, the beginning algorithms uh, of calculus, pulling it all together. What's interesting, I think, about these two problem sets, guys, is they really don't seem to be related, do they? The geometric problems of tangents and areas, what do they have to do with velocities and trajectories of, uh, of moving objects. Um, one could even say, not only are they very different, they're really of, even of a different interest. One problem, the geometric problem, seem very specialized, seem very narrow, uh, don't seem to lead to, to anywhere. They would be of interest to geometers. Okay, fair enough, geometers are interested in things like this, but they don't seem to necessarily lead to anything of great import. Whereas one can see more easily perhaps where these questions of motion, if these problems could be solved, right? Then we get into maybe explaining and understanding uh, the processes of change in general. And now maybe we can see where understanding the, the, uh, the mathematics of change, beginning with those problems of motion could lead very much 
to a very powerful set of mathematical ideas, which could be used to attract many, uh, attack many, many problems uh, in, in science. But it is funny that the two sets of problems don't seem to be uh, related. One of the things that we have to do in our course is to see the relation between, between the two. Um, and uh, this will tremendously help our conceptual understanding of what calculus is about, because we'll see it from two very different points of view. And if we can marry those points, if we can move easily from one point of view to the other, our intuitive understanding of the problems and how they're solved uh, will, be, will be greatly enhanced. So in terms of the motion problems, uh, here's just an example. Uh, these are basically the Galileo problems. We'll be looking at these at some point in the course. The uh, problems of the motion of a projectile. For the very simplest one on the, on the, on the left here of, of simply free fall, just dropping something and seeing that it's falling faster and faster, there's our classic problem. Here's something which is moving at a non-constant speed. Okay. Can we find a way to measure that speed as it's going faster and faster? And then we have the various you know, variations uh, on the theme of just not just dropping the ball, but throwing it up where it gets slower and slower for a while. And then it, in a sense, stops at the top. Uh, in that sense, we go to for a moment, for an instant, it's no longer rising, but yet it's not yet falling. So it's not moving up. It's not yet moving down at that very top. Uh, and you can see where maybe there's a relationship in the speed issues about finding extreme values. Uh, here would be an example of an extreme speed, a speed of zero. To find when that speed is zero would be an interesting question. <clears throat> and then the more general projectile of actually throwing something out or throwing something up and moving in a, in, in a true curve like this, as opposed to just moving straight down or straight up and straight down. So again, what is the relationship between these two sets of pictures? Not clear. Clearly, <laughs> there's, uh, there, there's something to explain here. Okay. Before we begin the ideas of the calculus, let's just see where, you know, to make a small argument of where they may go. Uh, in the scientific revolution, the great problem was the problem of motion, the great problem of the motion of the planets to understand the motion of the planets in the sky. And the great leap forward after Copernicus changes the model from a earthbound system, geometric system to a earth uh, uh, to a sunbound system um, uh, model of, of the motion of the planets, we get Kepler's three laws. Um, and um, the second law is a very interesting one. First of all, first law talks about a shape, a curve, uh, an ellipse. But the second law may maybe kind of resonate with us here because the second law says that the area that a planet will sweep out at any particular time, no matter how fast it's going or how far away it is from the sun at any time, that area that the planet sweeps out, let's say in a month's time is the same, no matter what month you take. The area that the planet will sweep out is always, the, at, always sleeping out at the same rate. So here, all of a sudden, in Kepler's second law, areas appear. Uh, so maybe we aren't so far away from those geometric questions and those questions of motion. <clears throat> Ultimately, Newton comes along with his uh, laws of motion, three famous laws of motion, and the law of gravity. This is the law of gravity in differential form. This is the differential equation of the law of gravity, which will explain among many other things, those three laws of, of Kepler. Okay. Why is it called a differential equation? Well, because it's got derivatives in it, whatever they are. But here we're dealing with the, uh, the algebra of numbers, of real numbers. The numbers here are all you know, real numbers, uh, how real numbers change, the ma mathematics of change. <clears throat> and of course, this is the basis of all of how NASA and everyone else shooting off uh, rockets uh, to various places in the solar system. This is how you get from A to B, by following these laws. And we'll be able to look at the very, very end of our course, try to give a little nod as to how this comes about, how calculus can do this, 
how calculus can map out uh, this incredible journey of the Galileo mission uh, uh, being launched from the earth and moving through this, through the vast space of the solar system, uh, visiting Venus and visiting um, uh, uh, different uh, uh, asteroids and finally winding up uh, at, at, at Jupiter after many, many years. How is actually this done? This is done using calculus. <clears throat> calculus also, you know, is, is everywhere. This is another version of calculus. Maxwell's famous equations of electromagnetism. This is a vector calculus. These are also differential equations that you see on the left. But here we're dealing with the calculus of, uh, of vectors, uh, a different kind of mathematical object, a more complex mathematical object than just simply real numbers. And uh, all of the laws of electromagnetism are written in the language of calculus. And finally, the Schrodinger equation, the heart still today, the heart of, uh, of elementary quantum theory. Here, this is another differential equation, another equation of calculus. But here uh, you see, uh, here, if you can see my, my, my uh, cursor, here's the number i, that's the imaginary number i. Okay? Uh, in the Schrodinger equation, these numbers here, this differential equation is about complex numbers. So the numbers that are being used uh, in calculus, the, the numbers that are changing, the, the numbers that mathematicians and scientists choose to use to describe these processes of changing are getting more and more complex uh, as time goes on, from real numbers to vectors now to complex numbers. But it is still essentially calculus. The essential processes that we're going to try to present um, during these eight classes have not changed in, in, these, in, in these three examples of, uh, uh, of, of different uh, differential equations. OK. So let's start with the problem uh, of, <clears throat> of with, that the Greeks have tackled. We'll take a circle. Right? The locus of a circle are all the points equidistant from a certain fixed point, C, the center. And this point P is on the circle because it is a fixed point, the radius distance um, from, the, from, from C, and every point on that circle fits that locus. This is the way the Greeks described curves. They didn't have analytic geometry, they didn't have equations to write down. They had to describe a locus in words, and those words then had to be translated into, into geometry. Mathematics is always a process when you're dealing with certainly applied mathematics. Mathematics is always a process of translating into at least one version of mathematics, if not many. And matter of fact, what we'll see in the genius of analytic geometry is we can take one set of problems, translate it into set a, a geometry configuration, and then translate that into an algebraic configuration in which the problem can be solved algebraically, which can then be translated back into the geometric solution that we were looking for in the first place. So mathematics is very much about seeing the same thing from different points of view. That's one of the famous definitions of, of, of mathematics, by the way. It's the art of seeing the same thing from, from, from different points of view. What the Greeks were able to find in terms of our basic problems was Euclid shows in his elements that the tangent line uh, for a circle, for a, that particular curve, is pretty easy to find. It's just the perpendicular line to the radius. And he shows the construction. This is a construction we all learn in 10th grade of how to construct a, a line perpendicular to another line, the radius line, at any point, this point P. So this problem is completely solved. The tangent problem of constructing the tangent line for uh, the, the circle, that particular curve, which is the, really the only curve that the elements deals with, is completely solved. Also, in book 10 of the 12 books of Euclid, it takes a while, but he finally gets around to proving that the area of a circle is proportional to the radius squared. Turning that into an algebraic equation, which he would not have done, uh, <clears throat> we would say that the area is equal to a times r squared, where a is some constant. That's how we turn proportion into an equation. What A is, he does not know. He does not say, he does not 
say anything about the value of A. He simply states it as a proportion. He would say, given two circles, the area of one is to the radius squared of that circle as the area of the second circle is to the radius squared of that second circle. That's as far as the algebra of the Greeks uh, in Euclid's day is going to go. He doesn't say anything about the, the, the computation of the area uh, using, using simple numbers. Okay. We'll have to wait for Archimedes uh, to, to find A as, as the number of pi, of course. But notice that once this problem is solved for the area of the circle, then we can you know, look at subproblems and they seem to be solved uh, as well. We can take a segment, the segment cut off by the chord AB, there would be the segment S, and we can find the area of, of S, notice by noticing that we have a section of the circle, we have a certain percentage of the circle uh, created by the angle there at C, um, and we know how to find the area of the triangle, that's in Euclid. And so we can subtract, we can say the area of the sector is the area of the circular segment, that quarter, whatever size C is, minus the area of the triangle. And so the, the problem of, of, of tangents and areas was completely solved in a sense in Euclid's elements back in 300 BC. Uh, so a good start, at least for the circle. Uh, the iconic curved figure, the figure always that all mathematicians start with. If you're talking about curves, you begin, you begin with the circle. By the way, in trying to save real estate, guys, what these little, what these round brackets, I'm simply saying the area of, the area of the, of the segment is equal to, now this is a number, this is a percentage, this is the angle C, let's say it's 90 degrees, so 90 over three seconds, the one quarter of the area of the circle. If this was 60 degrees, it would be then, you know, 60 over, over 360, <clears throat> one sixth of the area of the circle. And that would be the area of, uh, minus, I'm sorry, minus the area of the triangle ABC. I'm just trying to save myself some real estate on the PowerPoint page of not writing the area of, the area of, the area of. I very quickly run out of room. So uh, you'll see sometimes I'll use these squiggly brackets to, to express the area of whatever the geometric object is inside. And sometimes I think I've even used square brackets <laughs> surrounding them by square brackets as opposed to uh, the curly brackets. I apologize for the inconsistencies. Moving on, still staying uh, with the Greek idea, a more difficult problem would be for example, to find uh, the tangent line to a curve, which is not a circle. And here we have the great conic sections of the Greeks invented, discovered by the Greeks. They saw it as a cone like this and being cut by different, uh, in a plane in different ways. Notice if you cut the cone straight on like this, you'll create a circle. Whereas if you cut it on an angle like this, what you'll cut out <clears throat> is an ellipse. If you cut it here parallel, if you make your cut parallel to the slope of the cone, the edge of the cone, you'll create a what we call a parabola. And if you cut it any other way, not necessarily parallel to the uh, edge, but any other cut, um, you'll get what's called a hyperbola. And this is the way the Greeks thought of these uh, curves, literally as cuts of these uh, of the solid of the solid cone. <clears throat> but they did find a way to describe a locus for these curves. And we're going to focus on the parabola for now because it's the simplest of the three. It's one that we're quite familiar with in analytic geometry. Uh, and I think you'll agree when you see, it. oh yeah, I remember that. <laughs> so let's start with the way the Greeks would describe the locus of a parabola. It's gonna be more involved than this locus of a circle which is simply all the points equidistant from one center point. It's still gonna have equidistant distances involved, but it's going to be uh, a bit more involved. So in order to describe a parabola with the locus uh, uh, given by, the, by the, the Greeks, we have to start with a point F, now traditionally called the focus. And we have to start with a line called the directrix, which is simply perpendicular to the line uh, which the focus is on. 
and that line is called the axis. So we start with two perpendicular lines. Uh, the bottom line here is called the directrix and a point, we pick a point on the, uh, the vertical line and call that the focus. And now we're ready to describe the locus. <clears throat> the locus of a parabola is all the points equidistant from the point F and the line, the directrix line. We have to find the points which are equidistant from F, simply draw a straight line from that point to F, what is that distance? And then from that point, draw the point straight down perpendicular down to the directories, right? And the distance to a line is always the perpendicular distance from any place. You always draw a line perpendicular to the line. That's defined as the distance to that line. So the locus looks like this. I hope a familiar uh, picture for many of you, picture of our parabola. And how would we construct such a point? How do we construct this locus? Because that's what the Greeks would have to do, construct it point by point. And so we take a point on the directrix, D, and we're looking for a point that is on this line, on this black vertical line, because the point that we're going, the distance we're going to measure is from point on that line straight down to that point D. It's always the perpendicular distance. And I also need uh, my point to be equidistant from D to the focus. Okay, so I need a point which is equidistant from both D and F, which also lies on that black vertical line going through D. Well, again, Euclid tells us how to find all the points which are equidistant from F and D. That's simply the perpendicular bisector of FD. Every point on the perpendicular bisector is equidistant from the two endpoints. Perpendicular bisector looks like this. Every point on that green line is equidistant from F and D. We also need our point to be on that vertical line uh, going through D. So therefore the intersection of that black vertical line and our perpendicular bisector line, that's a point that we're looking for. That is a point which is equidistant from the line D straight down and the focus D. And what we've created here is an isosceles triangle where FP is equal to PD. Okay. Quite involved, quite a construction to create this point P. Okay. The good news <laughs> uh, is that we've also constructed the tangent line. That green line turns out to be also the tangent line to P. So we get that in the Greeks for free, not completely for free. The Greeks have to prove that that is the tangent line to P. It looks good. It looks like the tangent line. Maybe we should stop and, and describe uh, define what the tangent line is. Um, the Greeks said the tangent line was a line on one side of the curve, had to be on just one side of the curve, which touched the curve in just one point. So clearly just drawing a line through the curve would not work because that line is on both sides. So the tangent line has to just kiss the curve at one place and stay on one side of the curve. And this green line looks like it, it fits the bill, but it would require a proof to show that that line does in fact, uh, you know, satisfy that requirement that it touches at, at P that we know, but it has to stay on that side. That is that green line can't touch the curve in any other place. That requires a proof, which the Greeks were able to supply. We won't, we won't uh, be doing much synthetic geometry, so we'll, we'll, we'll take their word for it. Let me do one more. So that's the tangent line. Let me, let, let me do this one slide. Let me kind of finish this idea, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll take some questions if there are any. Let's now compare what I just described, what the Greeks would do, Greek geometry, to study the parabola and ask a question like, for example, how we find the points on the parabola, how we find the tangent line. We just described how they would answer that question. Let's see the very different situation when we have analytic geometry, when we have this structure here to begin with, to work with, okay, our X and Y, uh, axes, <clears throat> the so-called Cartesian plane, uh, the Cartesian axes uh, named after Descartes, of course. Okay? So we start, here's where the, 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 the two different kinds of mathematics begin. The Greeks start with nothing. <laughs> they start with a blank plane, a blank sheet of paper. They have no structure at all. 
everything must be built from scratch over and over again, starting from scratch. Not so with analytic geometry. We begin here. We begin with this frame of reference. Yeah, frame of reference, right? An important phrase in the theory of relativity. <clears throat> uh, but we begin with a frame of reference here. We have a starting place. We have a structure. Uh, we're able to identify any place on that plane with a pair of numbers. Okay, we have a way of, of, of addressing any point very specifically. Okay? We have a lot of structure looking at us just to begin with, the power of analytic geometry. Well, let's see what the Greeks have to do. They've got to go ahead and create their axis, create their focus, create their directrix. <laughs> so, they're, so they're beginning to at least be able to describe the locus. Without all that structure up above, the, the, the locus sentence wouldn't even make any sense. Okay, the locus structure is defined within what had to be created beforehand in terms of these two perpendicular lines and the focus point. Okay. What does the analytic geometry require uh, in preliminaries before we get to the, whatever the equivalent of the locus is? Nothing, it's all there. It's all there waiting for the equivalent of the locus to be stated. So let's, we have the locus and we go ahead and create uh, the many, many points that we want. How do we do it in analytic geometry? No, we create the structure that we create our curve by writing down an equation. The equation is y is equal to x squared. That's the equation for this parabola. We immediately generate a table of values. We immediately begin to make computations. We take various different x values, minus two and minus one and zero and a half and one. We, 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 we take all these x values and compute for each x value its square. And these points that are points on in our, in our Cartesian plane create the very same curve, but it's done computationally using uh, a table of values. And here what you're looking at are the three aspects, the three ways of looking at this curve. Uh, one is the curve itself, of course, the graph. The other one is the equation that is also embodies the curve and the table of values three different ways, three different ways of looking at the same thing. And they each will tell us different aspects of the problem, but they're very much related. And to understand the relation between those three aspects is, is vital to be able to use it effectively. Okay, well, how do we get uh, a, a particular point? Well, we have to, uh, from, from Greek geometry, we have to pick a point on the directrix and go through that construction. Uh, and each point <laughs> requires a totally different uh, construction, the same kind of construction, but it requires getting out your compass and your ruler all over again to pick another point on D and going through that construction to construct the point P, one point at a time. How do we do it in the world of analytic geometry? We simply pick a number, call it A. This number looks to be about one and a quarter or something like that. <clears throat> We pick a number, A. We use our computational rule, and there's our point. We're told that every point on this parabola has as its y value, A squared. And so the point is A, A squared. There's no construction involved. And we do exactly the same thing. We simply keep reading off points off of our table of values. We construct as many points as we like, just as the Greeks construct as many points as they like until they can get a sense of what the curve looks like by kind of mentally um, co collecting all the points. The tangent line, well, the tangent line comes for free in a sense with the Greek construction because actually constructing that point, uh, getting the perpendicular bisector of FD gives us uh, not only the point by its intersection with the vertical line, but that, that line, that green line that gives us the intersection turns out to be the tangent. So we get something for free. There's no free lunch. So there is nothing free here in the analytic geometry, except we do know what the curve, what the, what the line looks like. We know the form of the line. Yeah, the line, I can tell you any straight line that goes through a, a squared has that equation. I know that because I know analytic geometry and you, you will too. 
if there's one piece of, of algebra that we do need to understand for our course is we need to understand the analytic geometry of the straight line. After all, we're looking for the tangent line. That's one of our central problems is to look for the tangent line. So clearly we have to understand how you look for lines, how you describe lines in the platform of calculus, which is analytic geometry. So this is the one piece of algebra that I'm gonna ask you to stay with. Not today, we're not going there today. But take my word for it that this is the form of the line. Okay? Notice that there's an X and Y in it because this, this is the variables in the line. This is how we calculate Y from X by putting in various X's. The equation has A and A squared in it. Well, we knew those, that's the point that we're dealing with. So apparently a, the equation of a line that goes through A, A squared we see A and A squared in the equation. That's very nice. We can immediately write those down. Apparently the only number there that we don't know is M. That's called the slope of the line. And this is a very big difference between the Greek geometry and the analytic geometry. In the Greek geometry, we're doing constructions all the time. In order to solve the problem in analytic geometry, we need to find a number. You give me the number A, and what you're asking me, if you want to know the tangent line, <coughs> if you want to know the, num the tangent line, when I give you the point A, just tell me the value M. It's a completely different kind of question. It's a computational question. From A, given, of course, the curve, Y is equal to X squared, given the value of A, 2, all I need to know is M for that too. And I immediately can write down the full equation of the tangent line. We've changed the character of the problem from a geometric construction to a computation. That's why it's called the calculus. <laughs> because what we're trying to do is take all of these problems and turn them into computations, algorithmic computations. Now. We're not gonna talk about how we find that, that number M today, but it turns out that M is 2A. Simply take any X value you want and the slope is twice that number. That's the answer. Not important why that is today, uh, but that would therefore be the equation of the tangent line for that particular value, A, that particular point, A comma A squared. And there's the tangent line. As soon as I have the slope number, I can immediately graph the tangent line, immediately. There's no construction to do. <clears throat> Once I have M, I have my table of values. I can fill in, I can start filling in points. And by the way, I could write that one more way algebraically. I can solve that equation for Y if I like, kind of get everything over on one side. <clears throat> Hasn't changed all that radically. Just another version of the way a straight line can be written. And in fact, these two versions that we see uh, are important. We'll, we'll, we'll be looking at both of them eventually, not today. Okay, I said I would stop here. Let me go, let me go one more. Let me just finish the, the, the Greek story. Let's, let's just look, that was the change in story for a parabola. Let's just look at the area question and how that was solved. And then we'll stop for questions. <clears throat> that problem was solved initially uh, by a mathematician called Eudoxus, who was a uh, contemporary of Plato. He used this method called the method of exhaustion. We'll look at that in more detail in a bit. But the person, the the, the person who really, in, in, in his hands, uh, this great mathematical genius really solved in a very general way this very hard problem of area using this method of exhaustion. He is a master uh, of this technique and is taken as about as far as it can be taken until we get to the platform of analytic geometry we'll see that there's very little progress actually in the area problem uh, after Archimedes until we get to the scientific revolution because the way he solved it, basically there's really no other way of going without we having a slightly different platform. Then the way in which that platform handles the problem is not so fundamentally different as we'll see uh, in, the, in the next slide. But let's just see how, how Archimedes uh, solved the problem. We have this parabolic segment, this parabola A, B, G, and we draw a straight line A, G. So we cut off a piece of the parabola. 
and you want to find the area underneath that segment, uh, composed by that segment. <clears throat> so what he does, he constructs this straight line AG, creating the segment. And the first thing he does, he finds the point B, the furthest away from the line AG. Ha, huh. there's that extreme value again, isn't it? We're looking for a point the furthest away from a line. Okay, this is a problem that Archimedes has to find. He finds this point B, uh, and then he constructs the tangent line. Ah, huh. there's the tangent line to that B. Here, the tangent appears in the area problem. Interesting. And then he constructs, once he has his B, from, from using the tangent line, he can, he can construct the triangle A, B, G in purple and find the area of that, uh, of that, of that triangle. It's called a quadrature in, in the Greek geometry, basically turning the uh, figure of the, of the uh, triangle into an equivalent uh, rectangle. That would be the quadrature and therefore we can read off the area. <clears throat> of course, they knew the area of a, of a triangle was one half the base times the height, but the construction of the area would be to turn that area into an equivalent rectangle, okay? And that's called the quadrature of the of that triangle ABC. Well, okay, so that's what the quadrature, that's what that rectangle Z is, the purple Z. That's the same area as the purple rect triangle. But how does he proceed? Well, notice that the purple triangle creates two more segments, right? The, we have the line AB, that creates a blue segment up in the corner. And we have the line BG, which creates another segment on the right-hand corner. We have two more segments. We can do exactly the same thing and find the quadrature of those two triangles. Okay? Now we've absorbed more of the area of the, uh, of the segment. There's less area left. We have, we've uh, you know, accommodated, we've accounted for uh, really the most of the area. We're getting close to, to our answer. Or well, we can keep doing this clearly. We can then go ahead and work with the red uh, segments that are created by the blue triangles. <clears throat> and what Archimedes does, he's able to calculate what the blue area is from the purple area. The, 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 so the orange area from the blue area, the red area, which we can hardly see from the orange. He finds a series of numbers calculating one from the other. Okay? Again, how he does this right now is not important. This is the idea, this is the concept of exhausting the area uh, by using these, these figures that we do know the area of, okay? And that's why it's called the method of exhaustion. And his bottom line is what he shows is a very beautiful result that the area of the segment is very much related to the area of that first big triangle. In fact, the area of the segment is four thirds the area of that original big triangle ABG. A very pretty, re very pretty result. And that four thirds, of course, the small, uh, showing that the area is in the beautiful ratio of small numbers is a very Pythagorean idea, very dear to the Greeks that the world was made <clears throat> from simple mathematical ideas and ratios should be in simple whole numbers. And here Archimedes is showing this is very arbitrary parabola coming from a very complex process of cutting planes is actually has a very nice, simple whole number relationship to a, a very natural triangle uh, of that ABG showing that uh, that B is constructed from a tangent line parallel to the base that you created it, AG. A very, very pretty construction. Turns out that this basic idea of finding areas that we do know and kind of stuffing them in as best we can to get the answer closer and closer to what we're looking for, the full area, this, this idea does not fundamentally change. <laughs> we'll find algorithms that to, to, to shortcut uh, the answer, but this process will not change, okay? Uh, the one that Archimedes is such a master of. <clears throat> okay, well, let me stop there before we look at the analytic geometry version of this problem. And uh, Mike, can I ask if we have any outstanding questions? Uh, yes, we do. Um... They're all relevant, but they deal with tangents. Good. Um, and the first, I think you answered, uh, what's a tangent? But the second was related to that. Why are tangents important? Can you give ah, some okay. examples? 
Okay, well, I've given you, uh, I, I think one so far in Archimedes construction, <clears throat> the way Archimedes is, is, is able to actually construct that original um, uh, triangle, which turns out to be you know, three fourths of the whole area, the way he constructs that triangle is to find the point in which the tangent is parallel to the a, AG, which is creating the tangent. So the, the, whole, the whole construction pins upon finding that initial point P. How does he find that point B? He finds the line in which the tangent line at that point will be parallel to that base. That's what B is. And it's, 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 it's characteristic is its tangent has a property. Okay? So there's just one example of tangent. If you give me a little bit of time through our presentation today, by the way, we are not gonna finish this presentation today because I am throwing a tremendous amount of ideas at you. I'm throwing out all the ideas of calculus at you at one class. So we will not finish this presentation. We'll finish it next week. Um, but we wanna go through this slowly and, and answer questions because everything is here. The next seven lectures, presentations, or six if we need the, all of the second one to finish, will be going through the details, looking at these ideas again and again in a bit more detail, a bit slower, uh, trying, to, trying to flush them out. But literally, I've presented here, my, my scheme, maybe crazy as it is, is I'm trying to answer that question of the course, what is calculus about in the first presentation? So I, I very much appreciate that I'm throwing out a tremendous number of ideas here at, at one time. Are there any other questions, Mike, on the chat list? Um, there are. I'm, I'm wondering if it would make more sense for me to hand, a, hand the microphone over to someone who has a bunch of the questions. Very good. Um, and Antonia, I think you asked several of them. Antonia, you need to unmute yourself. No, I just did, thanks. I'm Antonia, by the way. Antonia. I'm, I am trying really hard to keep my head above water. Going the previous screen where the bottom line was AG. Uh, yeah. How can a line, it says it's a parabolic segment, but it's a straight line. I cannot understand why a straight line is part of a curve. Okay, it's not. The, the, the parabola is A, B, G. The parabola is A, Z, B, H, G. It's that envelope on the outside. That's the parabola. Okay. The parabola is a curve. What the line AG does is simply cuts off a piece so we can talk about a very definite area. We've enclosed an area by using a straight line. So, and then the, the other question related to that was, wouldn't the point at which another point was equidistant from A and G be infinite, you know, infinitely away and always parallel? No, I'm sorry. What I meant is the point on the parabola, which is the furthest away from AG. Okay. We're Thank talking you. Talking about the characteristics of the parabola. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Antonia. Any other questions? And Peter, this is Michael. Um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding the significance of Archimedes, um, starting with the purple <laughs> triangle and then moving to the blue triangles is that that could continue, right? And, and then he'd uh, do that again to eat up some of the area of those remaining yellow triangles until he had a total for the entire parabola. You, have, that you, have, you have nailed it exactly, Michael. And if you take a look at the left, the right part of the screen with the, sorry, with continuing the process, that's what I've tried to describe. You can see what I mean. There are so many ideas here that I'm throwing out that it's hard to keep track of what I'm saying, and I very much appreciate it. But what I've written there is continuing the process. He derives a formula to calculate the next area from the last. And he in fact develops a series of, uh, uh, of numbers uh, by looking at the areas of these various different rectangles that he's deriving 
from these various different smaller and smaller triangles. So what Mike has said is what I tried to say, but clearly not clear enough. Uh, and clearly what I tried to say was not clear enough for, for Antonia, that her questions were very, very valid. I'm working in a set of assumptions, which I didn't even think of a point being, you know, arbitrarily far away. I said, well, of course I'm talking about a point on the parabola. No, not of course. Not of course at all. These are my assumptions because, you know, I know the material so well that I've got blinders on as to what all the, the options are that, that, that one could talk about. So these questions are very, very important. This is why we all know there's no such thing as a dumb question. There really is not. Well, maybe one <laughs> out of, out of 2000, maybe there's one dumb question. Most are not because because what Mike just says, let me make sure if I understand and what he just said is exactly what I thought I said, but clearly I didn't say it clearly enough. So this is why questions are so important for us, particularly in our course, because our course is conceptual. Our course is not about mechanics and mechanics, you can always go back and just kind of look at the mechanics. Oh yeah, well, I see, you got to add both sides or whatever, blah, 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 you know, yeah, I missed that step. No, we're not, we're, we're not trying to do that. We're trying to work in ideas. And therefore, we need to make sure the ideas are clear, that they're discussed. Um, I want to encourage people, if, I, if a question is asked and I give an answer and they see an alternative answer, something which I'm not actually touching on, which maybe is relevant, that I, in their opinion, I could have said that would make things even clearer, please, during those, please don't interrupt the presentation, but during these question and answer periods, please add to, to, to the discussion. This is not just a binary, you ask a question, I answer the question and we go on. Not at all. Uh, and Mike was modeled that very, very well by, by, by breaking in and, and, and making a, an observation, which I thought I had already made. Um, okay, so not, not to belabor the point, but let us be interactive with these ideas because that's what we'll be doing for eight weeks, talking about the ideas of calculus and trying to broaden our understanding as we go on to see how this becomes the language of science. As, uh, as Steve Shogast says in that wonderful talk, I hope you're kind of working your way through that talk. I know it's a long one, but in the very beginning of the talk, he talks about that phrase uh, that, uh, Feynman, uh, that uh, Feynman says, it's the language that God talks. Calculus is the language that God talks. So we'll, we'll try to become comfortable over these eight classes with this language. It's not gonna happen today, guys. Not only is Antonia uh, struggling, I, I assume even the people who took calculus are struggling because it's so long ago. And these ideas have to be, have to be dredged up. Um, are there any other questions before I, I, I go on? Yes, I, I have a question. If that this is Vivian, um, it seems to me like the, the Archimedes would have to take an infinite number of tangents in order to come up with this definitive answer that the area of the parabolic segment is four thirds, right? Doesn't he have to take an infinite number of triangles? And that is such an excellent question. The answer is no, because he, he does want to take, in a sense, an infinite number of these triangles, but he doesn't have to construct an infinite number of tangents because Archimedes, the genius that he is, is able to find the area of the blue rectangle H from the area of the, of the purple triangle Z. He's able to see how to move from Z to H just using the information about Z without going back to the original construction again. He's a genius, he knows how to do this. And once he sees the path to go from Z to H, then he just reproduces that out, essentially algebraic process to go from H to Q. And he's able to develop what's called in the jargon, a geometric series of numbers, one related to the, to the one beforehand. And then looking at that series, the genius that he is, he's able to, to find the sum of that truly infinite number of, uh, of numbers because these triangles never end. How does Archimedes do all this? We have a whole class on Archimedes. <laughs> We're devoting a whole presentation to Archimedes. So if we could hold on that. Again, another just excellent question. Thank you. 
All right, let me, uh, let me go on and introduce the, how in analytic geometry, how the mathematicians of the uh, scientific revolution approached the area problem. You're gonna see it's not fundamentally different from, uh, from Archimedes approach. This is a hard problem. The area problem is a genuinely hard problem, harder than the tangent problem, as it turns out. <clears throat> and instead of using triangles, what, because uh, here we have, uh, I'll put some dimensions on this triangle so I can convert it to analytic geometry. Let's say we have a base of two and a height of one. Uh, and notice with that, using the area of a, of a triangle, one half the base times the height, one half of two times one is one. So the area of that triangle inside the, the what was the purple triangle uh, has an area of one and therefore Archimedes is able to prove that the parabolic segment has an area of four thirds times one. Okay? So this is you know, Archimedes result based upon the area of the triangle. Okay? Remember the area of a triangle is one half the height times the base uh, and the height is two and the base is one. And so we get back to one. Okay. In the context of analytic geometry, which we have so much more structure, okay, in which we have an equation, okay, it turns out the equation of that upside down segment is one minus x squared. Don't worry, take my word for it, not important right now. We'll see why eventually, not important right now. But this locus can be turned into an equation. Okay? And instead of dealing with triangles of all different shapes and you know, fitting them in in all kinds of crazy ways, in which you have to be a genius like Archimedes to handle, uh, instead what the scientists and the mathematicians of the scientific revolution are gonna do something much simpler. They're going to work with rectangles, very simple rectangles. So they're gonna partition their base from minus one to one into a series of rectangles. The, 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 the width of the rectangles I'm gonna show here is a quarter. <clears throat> so I'm going to take every single quarter and, and, and make a partition. Okay? Now I've partitioned my base every single quarter. We have minus one to minus three quarters to minus a half, minus a quarter, then zero quarter, a half, you know, <clears throat> we're, moving, we're moving down by a quarter each time. <clears throat> all the bases of my rectangles will all be a common base of a quarter. Now, how do I construct my, my, my rectangles? Very simple way. I simply pick the midpoint of each interval and I draw myself a rectangle. I don't need to be a genius like Archimedes to do this, okay? All I need is a calculator to find the midpoint, to find the, the, the value, the Y value at that point, and that's my height. And my area is height times width. Widths are all the same, only my heights are gonna change. And I do this for every single interval. I get a very simple height by using my computational rule, y is equal to one minus x squared. Notice what the numbers are, are not important. We simply know that the y values are changing from the computational rules. We are getting a series of rectangles. And of course we can do it for the entire, the entire segment. Notice the fundamental idea, guys, has not changed. We're just, we've just simplified it because we're much simpler people than Archimedes. We don't know much about geometric series. And so we don't know about how to construct you know, base triangles with finding you know, the tangent line that we need and finding the, this we can do. This we can computationally divide up the line into an even number of segments, take the midpoints of each one, do the computation of the heights and simply add up the total area of the rectangles. Height times base plus another height times base plus another height times base for all the rectangles that we have. It's simple. Okay, the idea hasn't changed, but the, the process that we're using because of the, of, the, of the structure of analytic geometry allows us to not have to be a genius like Archimedes to build it up into a bunch of areas that we can understand. Okay. And notice there is one simplification that I asked you to look at, and this is important. This is where when, we, when I point out some algebra, it's because it's important to see the algebra. That notice that that sum of rectangles, h1 times delta x, delta x is simply the width, the common width of all those intervals, is h1 times delta x, that's the height times the width, plus h2 times delta x, that's the next height times the width, plus h3 to, plus h8, 
times delta x, okay? Those are the areas of all the rectangles. This is an approximation of the area, just the way Archimedes' first triangle was an approximation of the area. Okay, I can factor out all those delta x's. They're all common. I can pull those all out. And the algebra does simplify to it's simply all of the values, all the y values of those midpoints, all multiplied by one common delta x. This is important to see this, that this is a tremendous simplification compared to what Archimedes has done. Not conceptually, not at all, algebraically, because we have this structure and we have this, not a locus, but an equation, one minus x squared, I'm e I'm, it's very easy to compute these h's. And if I'm clever enough, I can certainly add up these h's, get one and multiply by delta x. I've again changed the problem just as we did in the construction uh, for the tangent. We've, we've, we've moved away from having to be a genius <laughs> to just having to be patient and use the same thing over and over again to use these rectangles. <clears throat> and let me show you what I mean. So here are our rectangles. <clears throat> here is my delta x here of a quarter. This is exactly what we have here on our PowerPoint slide. However, I can do better. I can, I can break this up into better than a quarter. I could break it up into a fifth. Yeah, and have slightly you know, smaller, thinner triangles. And presumably I'm getting a, a better area because here I've you know, got less, less white space uh, and, and less overlap. Notice that uh, my area changed. Notice in the one quarter, my area is 1.344. That's the area of the rectangles. That's the only thing I know how to compute. Uh, if I make the divisions a fifth, I get 1.340, a little bit smaller, hopefully a little bit closer to the true area. I could break this up into tenths and have much narrower uh, rectangles. Here I go from to 1.335, okay? And the last one that I programmed here was a 20th, okay? Pretty narrow triangles. You, know, you can see the area is pretty close. Don't have a lot of white space, not a, not a lot of overlap. And notice that I'm getting closer and closer to 1.333, aren't I? We can see in our mind's eye, this is becoming closer and closer to Archimedes' number of four thirds. It does work. <laughs> this scheme will work. This is the method of exhaustion. We're just using dumb rectangles <laughs> and a calculator because we have the structure of analytic geometry. Okay, we're following Archimedes' footsteps, but we say, Archimedes, we can't go where you went. We don't know how to do what you do. This we know how to do. Okay, with patience, we know how to do this. Now, of course, we're not going to get very far in this scheme. Um, um, from, from complex for complex areas, we're gonna to have to find a better way. We're gonna to have to find a way to take this process and turn it into an algorithm that we understand. We're never gonna be an Archimedes. What he did, we're not gonna even try to do, but we're gonna to try to take this process and see if we can see a pattern. He saw his pattern. He saw that wonderful geometric series. Can we see a pattern? Can we find a way to simplify this not the idea itself, but the way the computation goes. So they're not, we're not just getting better and better decimal points, but we truly can show that no, this area actually is getting closer and closer to that beautiful number four thirds. Can we get there? I'm glad to tell you the answer is yes, we can. Okay? But it's gonna be a bit of a journey for us. Okay? And we're not getting there today, okay? I'm not even attempting to try to show how we get there. But we can see that the area is getting closer. If we can find a way to make this process in an algorithmic kind of way, we could, we could, we could get there. Okay, let's go back to our presentation. All right, so in the last few minutes that we have, let me introduce the objects. Let me introduce the objects of calculus, and that is functions. Okay. What is a function? A function is a computational rule which operates on each input number to produce a single associated 
output number. If x is the input number, then we call f of x is called the, is the output number. It's called the function of value. With this expression f of x, we've moved away from symbolic algebra. That does not mean f times x. f is not a number, okay? We have moved away from algebra. We now have symbols which are not numbers or plus and minus signs. f is a function, f is a relationship between numbers. It is a much higher level piece of notation. It's a true abstraction. So f of x represents the computational rule. And one way to think about a function, a nice way is this kind of box here of inputs and outputs. A function takes in an input, a number, x, called the independent variable, and it spits out <laughs> the number f of x, which we call the dependent variable. What's important is for any one value x, it only spits out one number, f of x. It's not ambiguous, okay? I can put in a different value of x and get the same f of x, that's okay. But as long as given any one x I put in, the machine only gives me one output value for each input. That is the, the heart, the idea of a, a, of a function. And so the machine itself, we can call f. And here's an example of, of, a, of a computational rule. A very nice computational rule, triple the number and subtract one. Very nice rule. Very easy to follow. <clears throat> if I have, uh, for example, look in my table, the number one, look at what the function of value is. It's two. I triple the number, get three, and subtract one and get two. I could take the number two, triple the number, and get six, subtract one and get five. I could take any number I like, like z. I can triple that number, three z, and subtract one and get my rule back, three z minus one. I purposely stayed away from the negative numbers. I think most of you can handle the computation of the negative numbers that if you triple negative one, <laughs> you will get negative three and such. And so that when do we get negative four? If you can't, not to worry, not important, a detail, okay? Not important that we know how to actually handle algebraically negative numbers. Do not worry about this, but please take a look at the positive numbers and see that all we're, that we're doing is following a computational rule. And then you can trust me just as if you're trusting me, but I hit the buttons on a calculator correctly. So multiply three, two digit numbers by a three digit number. I give you a big long number. You trust me that I hit the buttons right. Trust me that I did th those computations right. If you, if you don't follow the, 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 the algebra of the negative numbers, not important. But what is important is to understand that we do have a computational rule and it does work for numbers that we, that, you know, numbers that we do understand. But we have another way of looking at this function, right? Because we have the structure of analytic geometry, because we have a geometry that goes with our algebra, okay? And each one of these uh, entries in the table of values is actually a point. It's an X number and a Y number. It's a minus two, minus seven. That's a place on the graph, right? Minus two, minus seven. You go over X minus two and go down seven to minus seven. Another point, zero minus one. That's a good number. Triple zero, you get zero. And subtract one, you get minus one. That's a nice point uh, on the, in the table of values. And then we saw two, five. Triple two to get six and subtract one and get five. And in fact, every number, uh, that you can generate on this table will, will, will form this kind of a pattern. And in fact, what we have here is a straight line. So here's a computational rule that gives us as an example, a straight line. And every point in our table of values will fall on that line, I guarantee you. Don't worry if you don't, if you don't see that. It's not necessarily obvious. We'll be looking at that later as well, not today. And so if I take any other point, okay, for example, one, you can see there, the X value seems to be about one. I try as best I could, one, and sure enough, the Y value is two. And there's a point in the table of values, one, two. Every point in the table of values will show up on this table. And if I took any arbitrary point on this line, it will show up, it will fill, fulfill the computational rule, okay? These are the objects we'll be studying. You see, they're very close to two to equations. All I have to do is say now that y is 
my independent, my dependent variable, that y is equal to 3x minus 1. y is the function of value. And I'm back to my curves. So functions are, in fact, curves. Why do I go through this elaborate notation of curves with the brackets and the functional values and the whole deal? Trust me, that we'll see. We'll see how essential this slightly different point of view is in understanding the other points of view, how powerful this idea of a function is, how powerful it is is to see that the curve is actually in, is just an embodiment, just a physical representation of a relationship which is you know described is in, you know is in fact the function. What a powerful idea that is. Trust me on this. It'll take a while to convince you, but I think I think with time uh, we will. Let me just finish this slide. The idea: um, functions can have value input values to be restricted. Can't be a completely the wild west. Here are the two most important examples uh, for us uh, algebraically. Is for example, you've had a function one over x minus one. It's a nice fraction, but notice if you make x one, you're going to get zero in the denominator. That's a no-no. Can't get zero in the denominator. Algebra will not tolerate that. Okay, calculus will we'll get to that, but algebra will not. Will not. So here's an example uh, that you can't use one as a as an as an independent value in that function. Okay, it's illegal. Okay. Another simple example is is numbers uh, negative numbers under the square root sign, as you might remember that gives us imaginary numbers. We're not going to deal with imaginary numbers here in our course. So if we have a function the square root of x, we don't want to deal with the square root of minus one. Okay, that's actually the number i. Square root of minus two is is two i. We 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 will completely stay away from complex numbers. So we're not going to deal with functions that generate complex numbers. This is a perfectly nice function as long as x is zero or above and has a very nice table of values and has a very nice graph. We'll stay on the uh, on the positive side uh, of that story. Okay, so we've done a lot today. We've introduced the problems of calculus. We've seen how the Greeks have attacked it conceptually, not actually in their true geometry, but only conceptually. We've seen how the the, the platform of analytic geometry can turn those problems into another way of looking at them very computationally uh, and seeing how we can try to generate computational answers to those problems. We've seen all those ideas. And finally, we've, we've introduced this idea of a function, which basically is a sophisticated way of thinking about those computational rules, a sophisticated way of thinking about those curves that we're trying to find tangents to. Notice, by the way, that I give you a curve and when I ask you for the tangent line, what I'm really asking for is another function, aren't I? Because the straight line, as we see here, is a function. It has a table of values. So that tangent line is itself a function. So if I give you a curve and I ask you to find the tangent line, aren't I asking you to find yet another function from that original function? You see where I'm going here. We're going to be working with these objects uh, in a very coherent kind of way. Sounds complicated now? I bet you, I, I bet it is. But give it, give it time and we'll see how natural this stuff is. All right, guys, let me, let me stop there and, uh, and, and open it up for, for final questions. Anybody would like to unmute themselves? Mike, if you wanna read from the chat, if you think something is uh, good out there. Um, I, I think on this last slide, Antonio was asking, where did the one come from in the f, f of x equals 3x minus one? Oh, I made it up. I, can, this, I could okay. have said 3x minus two. <laughs> I could have said 3x minus pi. <laughs> I just made it up as a rule. Peter, this is Sharon. I just want to thank you for the Stogatz video. I, I wish someone had shown me that when I was in high school. I was a junior in college in electricity and magnetism before I understood what calculus was for. I promised the rest of the class I did not pay Sharon to say that. I really, I did not promise. But and she is I want you to know, I, I sent it to both of my great nieces who are in AP 
Oh, man. what a gift. What a great I gift. I said to them, I said, I <clears throat> wish one had shown me this when I was in your spot. You, so you, I, you are a good, you are a good, great aunt. Guys, I can't, I sent it, I, I can't, I I sent can't it to my granddaughter. Better. I sent it I to my granddaughter, who's a math major at Northeastern. And she's on her way home with my son-in-law. And she texted me that she's watching it in the car on the way home. Wonderful. Well, I can't, I can't get a better endorsement than Sharon. Please, if you have the time between now and next Friday, watch mm -hmm. that video. In fact, watch it twice. I'm quite yes. serious. Watch I'm it on twice. my way. Talk I'm on about, my way to Toadstool to buy the book. Yeah. Talk <laughs> about talk about throwing out a lot of ideas. <laughs> oh, watch it's great. it twice, guys. In fact, if you watch that video, it will make our course so much. You, he anticipated, mm -hmm. I, what I was very proud of about when I found that video, after I'd done you know, most of my preparation and I watched the video, I said, my goodness, I'm using the same basic ideas he is. I'm, I'm doing yeah. pretty good. This is a real mm -hmm. mathematician and I'm doing pretty good. And then I, mm -hmm. I found his book, read his book. And uh, it's a, it's a, if you're serious about this, if you'd like to go the next step, his book is the perfect next thing to do, uh, hi, um, uh, Hidden Powers. So I'm on my way to the bookstore. Uh, Peter, I have, a, I have a question. Having yes. having watched the video last night, which was terrific, I, I was interested by his opening comments with a little debate about, were these mathematicians of ancient times and since, are they doing it for their own pleasure because of the elegance and the intellectual challenge um, and or are they doing it to solve a practical problem in their society at the time? So like these ancient Greeks, um, why did they need to know the areas under these curves? I bet 99% of the people were, were slaves or laborers back in those days. And what problem were they solving or what practical application were they dealing with in Yes. undertaking all these mathematical exercises. Yes, thank you for that question. We, we will be talking about that at length in, uh, in, in our, our next uh, presentation when we get to the classical Greeks. Uh, but uh, it is a wonderful question. It's a very natural question. Where do these problems come from? You could say, well, they're, they're geometers. You know, and geometers are interested in, in, in figures. And so tangents would be uh, an interesting object for figures. But no, as it turns out that these these figures, these uh, questions, these properties like tangents come from very much, very real problems. But what's interesting is they're not practical problems. They're not problems from engineering. They're not problems from surveying and architecture and navigation. These are purely mathematical geometric problems. This is the character of the Greek mathematics. This is something invented by, by the Greeks. There was never any mathematics like this and told them that they studied mathematics for its own sake. But the tangent problem and the area problem were not in fact uh, pursued just for their own sake, but they were trying to solve a very definite set of problems, which we will look at as an interesting part of the, of the history of where calculus comes from. Thank you, just an excellent question. Peter, it's Michael again. Um, I, I want to make sure I'm not misunderstanding on functions. I'm used to seeing the word function used to include functions where the output is a result of several inputs. Something as sim simple as area is base times height. And here- Oh, you're Mike, oh, Mike, you didn't, if you take a look at the very next slide, <laughs> yep. I give the example of the perimeter as a function of both the length and the height. Okay. You're, okay. Absolute, you're absolutely right. Okay, I didn't uh, know whether this, whether it was important to, uh, that we were only talking about A equals F of B or whether it would include F of B and C. And as you see my sentence, in general, we will pi be primarily studying functions of just the one independent variable. Mike, your comments are invaluable, and I invite everyone to make comments like this and things that occur to them, even if it's <laughs> going to anticipate what I'm going to say later, or maybe more importantly, what I thought I said clearly, which clearly I didn't. Uh, so let's let's continue this dialogue, guys. All right, let me encourage you to do one more thing, as as <laughs> as selfish as this may be. The video 
for what we just did will be out this afternoon. If you have time, not only watch the Strogas, watch this video, watch this class again. You will be surprised how many things I said, which just went you know, beyond because I'm just either talking too fast or too many ideas. Watch this video again. I think it'll be worthwhile. All right, guys, this has been great. I'm going to let you go. I'm going to turn off the, um, the recording and we'll, and we'll stop.